Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, this is another seminar from the Cambridge Studies Unit. Uh, and uh, before we start with the presentation, I would like to thank the sponsors of the unit, uh, which have uh, provided uh, uh, quite support, quite a lot of support for our, our activities. Uh, I would like also to introduce uh, our speaker for today. Uh, is uh, Maria, our speaker is Maria Perez Ortiz. Uh, she's going to be talking about uh, towards planet centered artificial intelligence. Uh, Maria has a degree in computer science, uh, a master in intelligent systems, and a PhD in artificial intelligence by the University of Cordoba in Spain. Her thesis uh, has received numerous uh, awards, uh, regional and national awards in Spain. Uh, Maria has also been recognized as one of the most influential Spanish researchers uh, under the age of uh, 30 in information technology. Uh, after her PhD, she did a postdoc in Cambridge in the computer lab. Uh, she did another postdoc at University College London, and uh, now she's uh, there a university lecturer at the Department of Computer. Her interests are in planet-centered AI, and uh, she's interested in developing responsible AI technologies for the people and for tackling the challenges of human impact uh, on Earth. And uh, today she's going to be <laughs> telling a bit about uh, this, uh, this work. Uh, good. Yeah. So I think I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Uh, I think, Maria, you can share your presentation and uh, feel free to go. Great. Uh, let me share. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Oh, yes. but you did because you have three options, didn't you? Yeah. So you yeah, attach those. Um, but it only allows you, allows you to attach one at a time. Yes. So, uh, so. You think probably have to click on slideshow to present? Yeah. Sorry, I was I was just uh, wondering if you could see it. Can you see it in full mode now? Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Jose Miguel. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. My name is Maria Perez Ortiz. And um, as Jose Miguel said, I'm currently an assistant professor at UCL at the AI Center there. And the title of the presentation today is Towards Planet Center AI, which is a topic that I find unifies my research and my teaching. So I'm going to be covering different things that relate to um, AI for planet and people. Um, and trying to put together into one agenda. Uh, so a little bit about me, uh, this has been covered already, but I just wanted to say that um, I'm currently the deputy director of a new master that we've built at UCL. We just started three weeks ago, specifically on this topic of AI for sustainable development. And I'm the module leader of two courses within that master on AI for sustainable development and also responsible AI, which are two topics that are interrelated to many of the things that we are, I'm going to be presenting today. Um, so contents of this talk, I'm going to be covering a variety of topics. So I'm going to be moving fast uh, through different projects. But if you want more information on each of those projects, feel free, uh, please feel free to reach out and we can discuss much more about it. Um, so I'm going to be introducing this new program and mentioning why it's different from any other program on AI or ML. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about sustainable development, um, the impact that we are seeing of AI on this United Nations Sustainable Development Goal Agenda. And then I'm going to talk about different projects that I've done in sustainable ML. So I'm going to be covering things in the polar regions, uh, projects related to understanding humans and for planetary governance. And then I'm going to be putting everything together into my view of planet center AI. So again, we have created this new MSc at UCL and the first cohort just started. So it includes a variety of AI models. But what makes it different from any other program is that we cover a lot on sustainable development in one of the modules. So we bring to the discussion a lot of social and environmental topics. And we try for these AI engineers to really get exposed to some of the most pressing challenges that we are seeing. And we also have a project, uh, a course on responsible AI, where we see much more about transparency, privacy, causality, ethics, and so on. Uh, and those are specifically the modules that I teach. 
And for the master as well, students spend nine months doing a sustainability challenge with a stakeholder. So that's part of their uh, thesis. And one reason, well, two reasons why I'm very excited about this program is that we have students from all around the world, um, American, Europe, but also Nigeria, Mexico, Indonesia, Kuwait, Syria. And they come with very clear ideas of what they want to do to bring back to their communities. So we think that this program could really do a lot in terms of global development of, of, of these communities and for students to bring back to their nations. And our program has also a very high female uh, representation, not only women that come from CS and maths, but also the women that actually want to upskill in these in this, uh, techniques because they are really motivated by the social and environmental impact. So I'm going to cover a little bit of what we see in the module that is specific on AI for sustainable development as a motivation then for all the projects that I'm going to be introducing on this idea of planet-centered AI. And the main aim of the module is to answer the question of whether AI could help us create a more sustainable future, uh, both socially and environmentally. And why is this important? Well, because technologies as disruptive as AI um, they are accelerating global change brought by humans at a pace that we have never seen before. And this is happening without a clear unified agenda of, um, of, of that change. So this means that we really need to understand um, the intersection of tech and sustainability to really think about where we are going, where we are heading, and how do we govern this impact. So more specifically, how do we answer this question? So what we go through in the module is what is sustainability? What is development? Where do they intersect as concepts? And what is this agenda that we have set among almost 200 nations of the future, this United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Agenda? And where are we in terms of making progress towards that agenda? How are goals connected, for example? And then we, we focus much more on AI. Where are we in terms of developing AI and making AI sustainable? And how, does, how is it impacting sustainable development? And if we put together that impact to the impact that we want it to have, for example, by looking at those international agendas, how do they compare? And if they are not aligned, how do we align them? How do we align AI developments with the sustainable development that we want to see? So we talk a lot about, for example, what are the technical foundations that we are actually missing for AI to support sustainable development and how to build such tools responsibly. So, okay, this is very abstract up until now, but here I have a snapshot of different concepts that we talk about in the, in the course for you to see the scope of the discussion. So we talk about planetary boundaries and simulation intelligence, and digital twins, um, AI for discovery, different development theories, circular economies, um, liquid democracies, green computing. We discuss a lot about the carbon footprint of technologies, for example, and we talk about algorithmic governance and um, renewable energies, remote sensing, and how to interact, how to create that interaction and collaboration between humans and AI. So a bunch of um, different topics in this space of social and environmental work. So I'm going to introduce now much more this topic that I've been mentioning of sustainable development. And the first thing to say is that probably um, both of these terms are incredibly loaded. So we have more than 80 contrasting definitions of what sustainability means, um, but it's usually seen as sort of an ecological equilibrium that is linked to a set of limits, for example, planetary limits. Whereas development is that is about how desirable social change happens. And our ideas about development have changed massively over the years. So before we had it very linked to economic development, and now we consider many more factors involved in development. So sustainable development unifies society, environment, and economy, and tries to create an agenda for the development that we want to see. Uh, and this is important because if we do development without sustainability, we end up with the current status quo. Um, but if we do sustainability without development, well, I, I'm not really sure if we'll be able to make much uh, 
uh, progress in terms of sustainability if we don't engage in development theories, because actually these theories are the ones that drive the world political agenda. So the UN has set a series of agendas uh, surrounding this concept of sustainable development, um, starting from reports as well known as our common future and the future we want, where we all come together and think about what is the future that we want to see. Um, so the, uh, the agenda that we currently have crystallized in this report on the future we want, and it is a very interesting agenda. And the reason for that is that it's one of the first to put environmental issues firmly on the political agenda, but also to include very strong notions of human development and justice with the next generations. And it's also importantly, it has been created in a participatory way with almost 200 nations thinking about what development means, what are the challenges that we are facing and so on. So I'm not sure if you have seen this before, but um, I'll just go very quickly over these goals. So the goals of the agenda are no poverty, zero hunger, health and well-being, education, equality, or gender equality, clean water, affordable energy and clean energy, decent wor work and economic growth, um, industry, innovation and infrastructure, reducing inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, consumption and, and production that is responsible, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and partnerships for the goals. So obviously a very, very ambitious agenda, um, but it's also quite clear in what are the specific targets. So each one of these goals has a lot of targets that are clearly defined with performance metrics. So I leave you here an example on climate action, where you can see that um, some of the targets are specifically about strengthening resilience for natural disasters. And this can be measured, for example, in terms of number of deaths um, affected by disaster or improve education on climate change. And this is considered as the number of countries that include these topics in their curricula and so on. So why do we need a program, a course, or even a research agenda that, that links all the SDGs? Why not AI for climate action, AI for health, and so on, as we have been doing so far? And the reason for this is that um, all of the goals that I have presented are linked in an incredible amount of different ways. And I have here two examples that just came out a few weeks ago on this. And the first one puts on perspective something that probably you heard at some point during the pandemic, which is that climate change and environmental degradation can aggravate sometimes pathogenic diseases. And the paper actually reveals more than 1,000 ways in which this can happen. Um, now, the second paper talks about inequality and universal decent living standards and energy. This has meant that an awful lot of things. Sorry, is there a question? I think someone had the microphone uh, unmuted, but uh, okay. <laughs> I think it's been muted now. I think you can continue. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, the second paper talks about links about these topics to energy, and it shows that actually if we were to improve inequality in our societies, how we are doing in terms of that, we could achieve universal decent living for everyone with around 40% less energy, which already would be a massive climate change mitigation strategy. So you're beginning to see here how all of these links are, how all of these goals are connected. And I have here a few other examples of this interconnectedness. So for example, when we think about agriculture and food production, this usually constrains renewable energy a lot because they both uh, compete for available land. Um, and there's so many examples of this. Uh, Project Drawdown, for example, is, a, is an interesting one because they analyze around 100 solutions in terms of their impact um, to reduce climate change. And they show that, for example, educating girls and providing access to family planning is one of the top 10 solutions for climate change. And again, there's many examples of this. There's a very interesting one that I leave you here in, um, in um, reference about this massive ecological engineering project that they have about bringing herbivores back to Siberia and how that could actually um, preserve the permafrost, which is one of the biggest carbon sinks on earth 
that we really need to protect because um, as global warming hits our ecosystem, the permafrost could accelerate this much more because there's a lot of um, greenhouse gas emissions contained in the soil and it could create a very strong feedback cycle that could increase climate change. So you're seeing here how there's a connection between conservation and climate change, uh, climate change and, and health or inequality and social, so societal issues with energy or climate change as well. And this was one of the goals that we had with the program, introduce engineers to some of these most, some of these pressing challenges, but also how interconnected they are and what is the role of technology in all of that. So I'm going to be moving now to a summary of the impact of AI on the SDGs. And first of all, if you work on this space, you will find that you will move in between the hype. So often lots of people argue that this is already a reality, that AI and sustainability is a reality. And there are many examples to show that in agri-tech and health and so on. Uh, but on the other side, we find more critical scholars that say that this is an impossibility. AI and sustainability cannot go together. And um, the reason for that, it's all of these things that we are seeing about the high energy needs, the often politics embedded that hurt the most vulnerable, the fact that it's not integrated with local cultures and so on. So um, as I'm trying to navigate this space, I find that both sides are right in a way. Um, so when we check the impact, uh, and definitely it's a reality that these models are being deployed for this purpose. Uh, when we check the impact and when we look, for example, at this case of technology for tracking endangered species, there's a, this very interesting paper from social scientists at UCL that went to understand the impact of these technologies by tracking um, what's happening in India when we deploy these models. And what they saw is that they were actually making much worse the violence between poachers and rangers and civilians were suffering the consequences. And they were seeing truly a lot of issues that the, the introduction of this technology was creating. In some cases, it even created refugee crisis. Um, so it is a reality that we are deploying, but we are seeing a lot of unintended consequences. And on the other hand, we have a very interesting paper as well that tries to revive, review this impact of AI on sustainable development and shows how for environment, economy, and society, there are both positives and negatives. Um, so it might not be completely an impossibility if we manage to understand these negatives, for example, and begin to address them when we create these technologies. Um, so I leave you here a summary of some of the points made in the article, and please bear in mind that this, this has a lot of complexity in the topic. So when we talk about increasing industry productivity and automatizing human labor, um, we see, for example, that it can have a positive impact by automatizing dangerous work or taking these technologies to places where you might not have a way to do medical diagnosis, for example. But we need to think about what could happen in terms of job polarization or unemployment or inequality. And this can be seen in many of the, of the topics, so both in agriculture, in medicine, in education, and so on. But beyond that, there's a lot that AI can do in terms of understanding climate change, evaluating progress that we are having towards sustainability, um, a lot of things related to smart cities and smart grids to make more efficient use of resources, monitoring our ecosystems, providing warnings, and overall solve very big core science problems that could have cascading impacts in many other uh, applications. So the world could, in this case, implies that this is a possibility and the impact depends on how we deploy this technology and how we design it in such a way that we minimize these unwanted consequences. Um, so I leave you here another list on how we can inhibit. And probably if you work in this space, you know most of these. So we are talking here about bias, polarization, increased power inequality, the fact that often these, these methods can pose a cybersecurity risk and that they have a high computational cost. 
So this slide just tries to put in context um, how sustainability is often non-existent as a goal in AI ethic guidelines before we move on to, to different projects. Um, but here you can see two papers that comment on this. And we see that in most of the AI ethic guidelines, we focus a lot on topics that relate to transparency, responsibility, solidarity, trust, um, freedom, beneficence, accountability, bias, and so on. Um, but there's usually no mention or uh, it's almost non-existent topics such as climate change, biodiversity, ecosystems, and so on. And, and this is something that um, is important to change in a way because obviously humans are embedded into a bigger ecosystem and environment. And that's important to consider as well as, as, a, as a side of all of these ethics guidelines. Okay, so hopefully this set a bit of the scene on the field of um, sustainable development. But now I'm going to introduce much more uh, concrete projects that I've been working on in this sphere. And I'm going to be covering different projects in what I call sustainable ML through a quick overview of my past work, but also going into much more details on some projects that I have worked in the last few years. Um, so this covers AI for sustainable development, aligning AI with sustainable development and making AI sustainable. So I have worked in a wide variety of applications on ML and each, in each one of these cases, um, we've had to develop different models for all of these applications. And the main reason behind this is that I'm motivated by the real world impact. So in all of these cases, I was not only involved in the research, but also in the deployment. So all of these applications that you see here have been applied in or deployed in one way or another. Um, so you can see that um, I've covered multiple SDGs uh, in the research. And I started, for example, just to give you two quick examples before we move on, working on biomedicine. Um, and the, the model that I developed improved significantly organ survival. So we were trying to allocate transplants and finding which is the most um, compatible recipient in the waiting list to receive an organ, to receive this transplant. And this model improved a lot, organ survival significantly with respect to other systems that were uh, used around the world. And then I worked for a few years in sustainable agriculture and I developed a system based on computer vision with drones that could reduce herbicide application by 60%. So that gives you an idea of the impact that these technologies could have on the uh, sustainable development agenda as well. Um, and I'm going to introduce some of the other things that I've worked on a bit more in detail in the presentation today. So one thing that I realized while working on these real world challenges is that all of them came with very different associated technical challenges. So some of them needed high trust in the model by experts. Some of them really required data efficient approaches. Some of them needed interactivity with the end user or some kind of um, super resolution due to the low resolution of the satellite data. Um, but in none of the applications, there was actually a technique that you could just take out of a box and train it and deploy it. So all of the models actually required, or all of the applications actually required building something from scratch, thinking about the needs of that application. And I realized um, something that has also, that I have also seen by going to one of the sessions that happen in my department, which is called the nails and hammer sessions in which someone bring a data set, which is a nail, and people come with the hammers that they are developing, which is the models, the learning approaches, and so on. And the idea is to try to pair them. So try to uh, find a hammer that could be used for this nail that someone brings. But when you go to those, you find that the people who bring the most challenges challenging nails, which often are the ones that relate the most to the real world, are the ones that are left untouched because we don't really have something already ready to go and, 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 a, and a hammer that we, we have built already. So one of the things that I've been trying to do is to try to change 
the paradigm a little bit and try to think about, okay, what are the type of hammers that we need to create for the most pressing nails of our time? So this is essentially one of the things that um, we are trying to do with this program, trying to introduce students to some of the most pressing challenges and go back and try to find and develop a technique for those challenges. And that's also um, my um, the kind of uh, perspective that I have with my research. So again, the same paradigm we follow with the students and here you can find some of the MSc projects that I ran last year. Um, so we go from uh, a very pressing problem. So we can be talking here about deforestation or the growing prevalence of dementia in our societies. And we try to go backwards from that problem. We try to really understand the problem, try to think about what technology would be most suited for that problem and how to build it if it does not exist out of the box, so to say. Um, so I'm going to be moving now to specific projects on AI for sustainability. And this list is going to be quite diverse. Um, so I'm going to be talking about things like generalization bounds and educational technology and simulations and, and much more. And the first topic that I'm going to talk about is research in the polar regions. Um, so the polar regions have been and continue to be key in our discovery and understanding of climate change. And this is one of the reasons why I'm so interested in this in research in these areas. Um, so you can see here in this plot, which is a plot from one of my past works, um, what has been happening in the Arctic in the last 60,000 years in terms of temperature. So in this plot, in the x-axis, you have time before year 2000 in thousands of years. So this would be equivalent to minus 50,000 years from now. And what you can see in the y-axis is a um, oxygen isotope that is related to temperature. So the way we got this data is because we discovered that we could drill into the ice in the polar regions and discover information about paleoclimate. And by doing so, um, we could measure different um, oxygen isotopes trapped in the air. And with this, we realized many things uh, by looking at this plot. First, that our climate is cyclical, but also these cycles happen rather slowly, which means that we realize that actually the changes that we are seeing in our climate right now are led by humans and not by a natural change in our climate. Um, but also we saw that abrupt changes in our climate are very, very common and possible, and um, they lead to a systemic change. So they usually say that there's a small nonlinearity in the time series leading or preceding this massive change. So this project that I'm not going to talk much about, but I just wanted to use it to, as an introduction to, to other projects, um, was about can we find nonlinearities in the time series that precede these massive changes in the dynamic of our climate? And can we find statistical descriptors that could serve us as an early warning system to understand uh, these changes? This uh, was a project that I ran with um, um, people, some people from the European Space, Space Agency. And it was really not easy because we have only 25 of these events known to humans. Um, so again, we have to develop specific evolutionary time series analysis model to try to find those descriptors and do clustering of the series. Um, but again, I just wanted to use this to, to showcase how important the polar regions are. So again, because of the polar regions, we understand climate change much better. But they are also home to a very diverse uh, fauna. So we have polar bears and insects and walruses and foxes and so on. And there's more than 40 ethnic groups, indigenous groups, living there. Um, but the Arctic is changing, it's changing massively, and we are seeing now a very big reduction in sea ice, which is proving really, really um, um, difficult in terms of policy making. So again, Arctic sea ice has declined over 50%, and you have here an example of the yearly minimum in the last 40 years, how it has declined. And there's climate simulations that say that the, our Arctic might be ice-free, uh, in uh, in a few years, 
And this also creates a feedback loop because the less ice there is, the, the more the warming in the Arctic increases because of the way water and ice reflect the lights the, the light differently. Um, so this starts to motivate why we need skillful forecasts of what's happening in the Arctic. Um, and the reason is that the decline that we are seeing has a lot of consequences and there could be a lot of um, mentions here of um, how this affects indigenous tribes, how this affects all the fauna living there, but also importantly, this is affecting global climate. So there is a more, more and more evidence than that what's happening in the Arctic actually influence the climate as a whole. So if we get to understand what's happening in the Arctic and how sea ice is changing, we'll get a much better overview uh, of what could happen in terms of global climate. And the thing is that we have a lot of physics-based models that can skillfully uh, forecast more or less sea ice several weeks ahead, um, but they really struggle to, 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 to predict what's happening in longer time scale. So again, we really need uh, to connect this, um, uh, we really need skillful forecasts and we need to connect them to policies uh, to avoid, for example, shipping disasters and to protect the fauna and the indigenous tribes there. So I'm going to be presenting um, one project in that space. So this is a project led by Scott Hoskin at the British Antarctic Survey. And you have here the paper that we published recently. And he leads the AI for Environment research group there. So this was a massive collaboration between climate and computer scientists. And what we tried to do is to fill in this gap and build a predictive model of what's happening in the Arctic. And this was a data-driven approach as opposed to all the physics-based models that we've been discussing. And in this case, what we try to do is to forecast the next six months of monthly average sea ice maps. And we have this information because we have uh, passive microwave um, brightness temperatures from satellite for sea ice, and we could get an estimate of what is the sea ice for this area of 25 kilometers of resolution. And um, so the model is based on a convolutional unit architecture, which was proven to be helpful for pixel-wide mappings. So what we are trying to do is base on a series of uh, variables that relate to sea ice concentration and different climate variables um, to predict the sea ice concentration at different time scales. And we have multiple variables, as I mentioned, that relate to climate. So this could be the sea level pressure, the air temperature, different wind, wind variables. And we do some reanalysis to put them in, in two dimensional grids as well and use them as different channels uh, for our unit. But one important thing to mention as well is that not only the model learns from observational data, but we do a big pre-training experiment in which we learn a lot from climate simulations. So we pre-train um, the, the networks on almost more than 2000 years of climate simulation data. And this actually improves um, the model quite a lot and lets the model to have some kind of understanding of the physics um, even if it's not a physics-based model. And you can see here the, the results, some of the results of the, of the model for different Septembers, which are quite different in terms of uh, sea ice. So in black, you can see the observed ice edge, and then you can see our prediction for different lead times. Um, so you can see how at one month lead time, the prediction is very good. Um, it gets a bit worse as we try to predict for longer lead times, um, but it seems quite accurate. So we can, um, we have around uh, accuracy of 90% in all of these cases. So how did the model perform? So it definitely outperformed the leading, phase, uh, the leading physics-based model in the literature, especially on longer lead times. And you can see this here in this plot where we compare um, two very simple models, a linear trend of how ice is declining 
in the Arctic versus this uh, physics-based model and our ice net architecture. And one interesting thing um, is how computational computationally light ice net was. So um, it runs around 2,000 times faster on a laptop than the physics-based model will run on a supercomputer. And what we did was to try to open as well the black box of the model and try to look at what were the variables that were more important by doing some kind of sensitivity analysis. And what we found were that um, results were consistent with known causal links that the climate scientists believe to be there for climate variables and, and sea ice. And it's important to mention that um, the architecture that we developed is probably not um, the best that we could have, but we are continuing to improve the model. So we have created a model now that can predict daily changes uh, in sea ice, and it generalizes it not only to the Arctic, but also the Antarctic. Um, but still much remains to be done in this space, specifically to take this model to uh, policymakers, because one of the um, significant challenges that we have is the satellite is the resolution of the satellite data. So again, it's only 25 kilometers resolution, which might not be enough for any kind of conservation uh, challenges in that region. So one thing that we are working on right now is how to use some super resolution algorithms to try to get more, a bit more understanding of um, what would happen and at higher resolutions. Um, just want to be mindful of the time. So I'm going to be uh, passing uh, some of the, um, one of the topics. So I was going to work, I was going to mention something about uh, technology and the work we've done on, uh, sorry, on technology, on education, educational technology, and trying to introduce some of the, how we are changing recommender systems for the topic of education. But I think based on time, I'll just move to the next topic. Um, so one of the topics that I work on in terms of social sustainability is about capturing human attributes. And this is the whole topic of the postdoc that I did at Cambridge, in which we try to study how to elicit subjective human judgments, how to aggregate population preferences. And you have here two very simplistic examples of how you could ask a human for a preference. Obviously, this becomes much more complicated um, when you start to have many preferences and you have to deal with a graph of preferences that you have for, a, for many people within a population and you need to make sense of all of that, state, that data. Um, so all of this is founded by um, strong foundations of theory of psychological measurements. And we have done a lot of work in this space to try to understand human visual perception as, a, as an example, and what populations uh, differences that are in the way we see. And believe me, there are a lot. We all see and perceive in different ways, starting by color. And for example, the perception that we have of color changes with age as well. So we try to create a lot of different tests to try to understand how different people see differently. And the group is now trying to um, use all of that information to include in graphics, in, in design of um, screens and so on, so that they can be adapted much more to your vision. But the reason why I'm, I'm interested in this topic is because there's a lot of work now on recent applications that use these same foundations to try to understand human values and to include those human values in AI systems. And there's a lot of work as well on how to enable more what it's called liquid democracy. So democracies where there's much more civic engagement. So the way this works is that if you have a way of querying the preferences, for example, political preferences of your whole uh, population, and you have a way of making sense of all of them, of creating, for example, rankings of preferences, you could have much more engagement of citizens within their democracies. And there's a very interesting paper that I can point you to if you are interested in this, which is statistical foundations of virtual democracy that talk of specifically about this, how do we understand 
human preferences and human values and then integrate it in our political systems. And I think this could be one of the topics in which um, this type of models could have uh, most impact in terms of social sustainability. Um, in terms of, uh, there's a lot that we could be doing in terms of making AI responsible and sustainable. Um, and part of my work in this sense has been on how to certify the generalization ability of, of a predictor. And commonly, um, we know that uh, this is estimated as an average error on a test set, despite the fact that these sample averages have a lot of issues. So for example, sampling error, sensitivity to outliers, and so on. So we've done a lot of work on trying to redefine what it means to actually certify the performance of an algorithm by creating um, more ways of certifying the performance that links much more to generalization bounds for deep neural networks, which hold with high confidence. So I believe that this could have uh, an impact, for example, in terms of algorithmic governance and how do we create standards of performance for algorithms before deploying them. And this probably is not ready uh, to be taken to practice. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in this space as well. Um, but it might be the first step towards creating a new way of um, certifying the performance of algorithms. But um, there's a lot of downsides as well because um, for example, this way of certifying algorithms brings a, a massive computational cost. So there's a lot of um, things to be taken into account there. Um, and again, there's many things that could be done in terms of addressing the computational cost. I leave you here one paper in case you are interested on what we need to be doing in terms of Green computing and developing lightweight models and having better carbon tracking. And it's going to become more and more important to consider the costs and benefits of carbon uh, footprint of technology. And we did this recently in this paper um, for solar now casting. And actually, we showed in this paper that the benefits of, um, in terms of carbon savings with solar now casting, could outweigh significantly the cost in these kind of applications of supporting the energy grid. Okay, and I'm going to finally introduce the last project and then I'm going to wrap up and there will be some time for questions. Um, so this project is not something that is ready either. It's kind of like puts together a bit of a vision for the future and it covers a topic that I think will be very interesting in the future, which is AI for policy or earth stewardship. So we are going back to similar uh, plots than what we had before. And the subtitle of this ta talk was Tech for the Anthropocene. And this is a new geological era in which human actions can be tra tra traced in all the systems of earth. So you see here again, what has happened over the last 10,000 years in terms of temperature. But I want you to see now the era that we are living now, which is the Holocene. And this Holocene has been incredibly stable in terms of climate. And this has allowed us to develop agriculture, to develop as, as a civilization. And um, this is actually um, something that we consider that might continue for the last 50,000 years if it's undisturbed. But what many climate scientists are saying is that we are actually changing the conditions of the Holocene and we might be entering a new era and we need to be mindful of that. And because now humans are the ones that are having the most impact, um, we are also thinking about how can we change um, that impact or how can we govern that impact or how can we understand the trajectory that our earth is taking. So a lot of climate scientists are looking at potential trajectories for the earth and how to bring back the conditions that were very stable in terms of climate for us to, um, to thrive. So in this plot, you see something that uh, a lot of climate scientists are using with simulations to understand the different trajectories that earth could take from now on. And this is showing time and stability. And what this plot shows is that we need 
a system to steward the earth towards a stabilized earth because there are many other ways that the earth could go to less stable stable um conditions and we could be crossing planetary thresholds and creating a lot of intrinsic intrinsic feedback that means that we might not be able to live uh, later on this trajectory and actually we have already crossed four of these planetary boundaries that climate scientists have set for us so i call this computation to choose a future and this we've we've been doing since the 70s so we've been trying to use simulations with system dynamics um, models to try to forecast what's going to happen in the future and this was pioneered by this report called the limits to growth uh, which was a very interesting simulation on um, of the world essentially linking pollution um, services per capita food per capita non-renewable resources and so on and what this simulation um, predicted is that there was going to be a collapse of civilization and essentially we are seeing that the data that we have so far is matching that narrative but um i'm not saying i'm not putting this just to show or to show in any way that this um, trend that we are having will lead into a collapse but just to say that there could be a space here where ai or reinforcement learning could have a lot to do in terms of finding sustainable paths towards a future and this is something that one of my students tried to do this year so he said this uh, simulation environment which was based on a world earth simulation that tried to connect economic output and atmospheric carbon and renewable energies and he tried to um, use that reinforcement learning agent to see if we could find a path to a sustainable future and to do that he used a reward function based on these planetary boundaries that we've mentioned and the agent could do different things so reduce the cost of renewables degrowth the economy do both do nothing and this is probably a very toy problem, but what we saw is that the agent actually managed to find a sustainable path towards continuous renewable energy output and economic growth, and that there might be some promise in this type of AI systems that can help us to craft policies in very complex scenarios where we humans might actually struggle to predict uh, or anticipate consequences, feedback loops, and so on. Um, and this is partly one of my research agendas right now, and this is something that I also show in a different paper, and again, I'm not going to go into details here, but essentially what we show here is that AI or predictive models coupled with simulations could help us understand how some of the public policies that we are implementing are non-optimal, and this is what we showed in terms of um, policies that were aimed at reducing the spread of COVID during the pandemic, where I um, use 9,000 different social networks with different simulations and then try to do some large scale analysis and show that actually the policies that we have at the moment are not optimal. So I'm going to be wrapping up now. And my vision for this field is to integrate everything that human center means but much more um, and so we do this exercise um, with my students that we call AI beside the data in which we try to think okay if we could ask anything of these models if we had no restrictions at all what would we ask for what would be the features that we will um, dream of having and um, I have underlined some of the things that we have discussed today and some of the different aspects that might make um, AI planet center up to some extent. So consider it of planetary boundaries, uh, supporting human development with low carbon footprint, uh, interactive, collaborative, um, helping us to understand ourselves and, and so on. So, and one thing to realize here is that this set of features are also interrelated. So for example, transparency interacts with privacy. And um, I think these desired attributes will be crucial in terms of putting AI at the service of sustainable development. So for me, this sets some kind of agenda for, for these technologies. 
And if you found this talk interesting, I'm putting together the lecture notes of my course as a short book, um, which includes much more than what I've discussed today. And the reason why I'm doing this is because the students uh, motivate me to do so because um, last year we ran the course as an elective and they were saying that they think um, many computer science um, programs would really benefit from discussing all of these topics. And that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. And I just wanted to mention that all of the artistic pictures in this presentation have been generated with the OpenAI DALI 2 tool by inputting the name of the presentation. So Planet Center AI, Responsible Technology for the Anthropocene. And I found really poetic that um, when we input this to, to an AI system, it could be thinking of, for example, uniting hands with us to, to do more climate work or to protect the earth. And how it's telling us, for example, that we should be looking at the different trajectories that Earth could follow. And um, again, many thanks um, for listening. And I'll be happy now to take um, any questions you might have. Good. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Maria. I think it's been a very insightful presentation. Uh, we have time now for some questions. If anyone has questions, uh, feel free, for example, to either unmute yourself or write the questions in the chat. Uh, maybe I can st start with a very quick question. Uh, could you say something? I mean, you have mentioned this, this area where you are working on, on, on Planet Center AI. Uh, could you say a few words about the uh, other efforts of the community in this area? For example, if there is, like if people are interested in this area where they, they should be looking for uh, relevant works, for example, are there any workshops uh, organized in this area? conferences, uh, specific journals. Uh, can you say a few words about <laughs> the efforts of the community in, in this way and, and where, where we can find the people working in this area? Yeah, so I think there's many different efforts that are in different parts and they come with different names. So you can find sustainable ML, AI for sustainability, AI for sustainable development, AI for social good. And they all come with different, dif uh, a little bit of different um, flavors to them, so they are quite spread. So obviously you know about the workshop on tackling climate change um, with machine learning. So that's a big one. Now GMLR is also creating a special issue on climate work. Um, there is a sustainable ML conference that was created last year in Germany, but this is a very small kind of event in which they just take talks. Um, so you just submit an abstract of two paragraphs and you go there to work with scholars working on the same field. Um, but I think we need to do much more in terms of bringing the community together because we are all spread um, across different communities and with different names. Uh, and for example, I have not heard the, the term planet center a lot before, um, but I think because we are seeing a lot of human center AI, um, there is space for that name as well. Good, thanks. Uh, and if anyone wants to ask uh, any other question. I can ask, uh, <laughs> I can ask another question if, if no one wants to ask. Uh, uh, so I found quite interesting this ISNET. Uh, it's quite remarkable that it was able to, to improve for this physics uh, based model. And then what I found interesting is that it's still at a very short range, the, the physics-based model was still more accurate than the ICENET. And my question is, uh, you said that the ICENET was pre-trained on data from the physics-based model, uh, but I don't know if you thought about actually just uh, uh, using, trying to, trying to predict the output of this physics-based model directly, maybe for short time, uh, uh, scales, no? so that uh, maybe that could be also just uh, in, I don't know, to, to compensate the, the deficiencies of, of this ice net at, at those short uh, time scales. Yeah, I think that's one of the things um, actually we're trying to do with this new version that predicts daily, um, because there there's much more to capture um, than just the, the general long-term trend. Um, and I think 
exactly what you said is something that we tried and it did show improvements in that sense. So I think that's part of the ICENET 2 um, version um, where, yeah, there will be much more pre-training on different climate models and not just one of them, but we have a variety of models that we could use. So it will be interesting to see how much improvement we can gain from that. Good. Uh, I think we would have time for a quick question if anyone wants to ask uh, something. Um, <laughs> maybe I can ask the, the last question. Uh, so I, I like uh, this uh, problem that you mentioned, the solar now casting. Uh, could you describe a bit more in detail the problem and uh, what, what, what does it consist of exactly and, and how you obtain gains? Uh, from from solving this particular problem? Yeah, that's a very interesting problem. So because uh, solar and wind power uh, fluctuate so much, we need so much, we need predictions of how much output we are going to have in order to integrate it well into the energy grid. And if we don't have those uh, predictions, the problem is that the energy grid operators often they keep gas reserves running just in case they have a shortage of the renewable energies. So by doing that, it means that um, we are actually using a resource that is that contaminates 2,500 times more than the solar. So by, by running those gas reserves. Um, so it's very interesting to look at, okay, what are the carbon costs of this um, model that we are deploying to predict uh, solar energy and if we had better predictions how many um, carbon emissions we could avert by not running these gas reserves um, so that's what we try to do we try to do an estimate of how much carbon emissions does this solar narcasting have and what does that mean if we have better predictions and integration of of those predictions within the energy grid and that's what we saw that it could have a massive um, reduction, um, a very positive impact, let's say, in terms of carbon um, reduction because of that, because the alternative that we would have otherwise, which is, again, using fossil fuels. <laughs> Good. Thanks a lot. Uh, I think we are out of time. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for the great seminar, Maria, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. <laughs> Thank you, Jose Miguel. Thanks for the invite. Bye. 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 Bye.